Stanford University. Well, thank you guys uh, for co-hosting and allowing us to intrude on your seminar series. Uh, the Loke Visiting Professor in Human Biology is a physician that rotates among distinguished people who come in from the outside. And one of the things that we try to do while they're here is to help them make connections across the university with other faculty and students who are here. So this means that what we try to do is pair up with somebody um, to have them present a seminar and hopefully stimulate some further interactions and further discussion. So Professor Don Light is uh, the current visiting loke professor in human biology. He has his bachelor's from Stanford, uh, a master's from Chicago, and his PhD from Brandeis in sociology. He's currently a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. He also has two other positions. One is a senior fellow in the Center for Bioethics at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and the other is a senior visiting researcher at the Center for Mi Migration and Development at Princeton. Prior to this, he held faculty positions at Princeton and at the City College of New York. He has a long list of publications, of honors, of previous positions, and so on, which I won't bore you with. Um, his interests fall into the area of medical and organizational and economic sociology, of comparative health care systems and policy, and comparative health care systems is what he's teaching here at Stanford right now to undergraduates in the program in human biology. And he's also interested in societal ethics, including distributive justice, access, and rationing of healthcare. And what he's going to talk about today is a seminar entitled Bearing the Risk of Prescription Drugs, How They Became a Major Cause of Disease and Death, and it's something that he's very much involved in right now. So, um, thank you. Well, thank you for that really kind invitation. And I just want to say how delighted I am to be back at Stanford and to thank Carol and Don Barr and other members of human biology for making this, uh, this visit possible. And also um, to say uh, we're doing a course on comparative health systems. And I think we're having a lot of fun and learning a lot. Some of the students are here today uh, from that uh, class. And uh, it really gives you a whole different perspective on the uh, American system. Um, and I appreciate the, the uh, Freeman Spogli uh, Institute sponsoring this. I do do some international work. My first uh, Loki article that came out just as I was arriving was comparing US, Japanese, and European research productivity and, and uh, generated an, an editorial in the uh, Lancet. So I thought people might want to see that. And um, then tomorrow is a second article on how to get vaccines to poor countries, new vaccines at low income prices. And uh, that'll be out tomorrow in, in vaccine. But today we're going to focus on the greater risks and relatively few benefits of um, new patented drugs and the institutional drivers that it seems to me is reasonable to say exploit trust. And it's interesting that uh, when I came in, Don Barr told me of yet another news article about this matter. Um, but I've, you know, without making much of an effort, um, here are here are the, uh, sort of a summary of recent articles that have come out. So on October 18th, PLOS Medicine put on the web 1,500 documents on what they called, quote, the systematic manipulation and abuse of scholarly publishing by the pharmaceutical industry and its commercial partners in great detail. Two days later, there's a news story about the large sums that faculties are earning from companies to promote their products. A day later, there's an article on the gro gro growing trend in scientific fraud. On the 26th, an article on, uh, by the lead researcher for Gardasol and, um, and Severix um, uh, questioning whether women in affluent countries re really need to take those vaccines and uh, focusing on some of their adverse side effects. On the 28th, a new study of, quote, alarming weight gain and risk of diabetes amongst patients taking the uh, second generation antipsychotics, which is actually an old story because it broke in 2006 
when a huge number of documents were leaked to the New York Times um, documenting uh, how Lilly officers were instructing their sales force to uh, hide the evidence of serious adverse side effects because they said it might hurt sales. Um, <coughs> indeed, it might. Uh, on the 28th, um, an article coming out in JAMA on the commercialized and unsystematic training of American physicians in CME. And the next day, an article on the, in the New England Journal of Medicine on the need to get away from having companies write the FDA label about what the evidence is and documenting the ways in which those labels often uh, do not include information of adverse side effects or even deaths. Then on the 30th, uh, the Stanford and UCSF medical students organized a rally against Congress granting 12 years of market exclusivity to, to new biologicals on top of the 20 years of patent protection um, to stave off uh, generic competition and more affordable medicines, which the uh, Federal Trade Commission commented said was entirely unnecessary. And on the same day, a major report from uh, Wharton uh, on, the perver on pervasive deceptive marketing by pharmaceutical companies. And so it goes on almost every other day. There's a news item like that. And that's the context really for this talk, which is um, on something that's less written about. And that is the extensive uh, adverse side effects of prescription drugs and why that's happening. So my thesis is that <coughs> The, the way drugs are tested, approved, marketed, and regulated routinely causes widespread injury, death, with little offsetting benefits. And that's what I hope to persuade you is <laughs> indeed the case. At most, one or two drugs a year offer substantial new therapeutic benefits. And over time, that has built up a very impressive medicine chest. Yesterday, the Times was celebrating uh, Gleevec, which was certainly a tremendous advance. Um, that occurred. But about six out of every seven new drugs offer few or no additional benefits to patients. That's not surrogate endpoints, but hard clinical endpoints. And yet they have a greater risk of toxic side effects. Um, this builds really on the work of Phil Lee, who's with us today, and his book, which I am just ordered again, um, Pills, Profits, and Politics, written in 19. 74, um, where he and his co-authors wrote that adverse drug reactions cause, uh, caused 130,000 deaths in 1970, and far more people being hospitalized at great cost, that about 70 to 80 percent of those adverse drug reactions were predictable, um, and that the risk rises sharply, as everyone knows who knows about this field, with age with taking multiple drugs and with over medication. Um, the FDA uh, reports that ADRs in 2006 were the fourth leading cause of death. About 2,003 million serious adverse drug reactions in hospitalized patients, about 111,000 deaths in 2006. Um, there are many technical and methodological issues around any of the cause of death literature. So that could be another discussion about methods. But roughly, it's a major, perhaps even one might call it an epidemic problem. Um, now, this count does not include um, death secondary to drugs when someone gets dizzy and falls or sleepy and has a car crash. Does not include ADRs due to overdose, error administration, or other effects of overselling or confused labeling or bottling, uh, on which there's another whole literature to try to bring that to, to end that. Um, there are, it's estimated there are about 46 million adverse drug reactions a year in the United States. Most of them are very mild, medically speaking. But what's medically mild may be functionally quite um, disabling, um, losing one's ability to concentrate or to function or to judge things properly, um, or the ability to care for others. About 1.5 million hospitalizations a year in the United States from ADRs, about 3.7 million worldwide. And there's a cascade effect. So interactions are more likely for people who are taking a second, a third, or fourth drug. Um, patients um, given drugs 
uh, are then given drugs to treat the side effect of the first drug. And so that's another cascade effect. The number of prescriptions ha has uh, rose 72% from 1997 to 2007, far more than any evidence of, of either uh, illnesses or benefits. Yes? Lots of numbers, but a lot of them may be not very predictable. Do you have a, an idea that half of the ADRs were predictable and the other half were just minor side effects or you know that's not something I've studied and I, I want to limit questions okay. during the presentation but uh, okay. I have not studied that and I'm not medically trained and wouldn't be competent to judge anyway I'm an organizational and economic sociologist who studies healthcare systems and and uh, international policy issues uh, Phil Lee did that kind of work in the 70s and maybe we can pick up on that during the discussion period Okay. We can. Okay. Great. We can. Uh, <laughs> the rate of toxic side effects seems to be increasing. Um, uh, in the 90s, David Kessler uh, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine that they're increasing four times faster than the total number of outpatient prescriptions. Um, companies now fund the FDA, as you probably know, to review new drugs. People in the trade know that, but maybe uh, people outside don't know that. Uh, and that's a new development since the mid-90s, and we'll mention that a little bit later. Um, it, there is um, evidence that accelerated reviews uh, required by the industry in order to fund the regulator who is to review the qualifications of their drugs um, has, uh, has led to an increase in, um, in more dangerous drugs. 19.6% of uh, drugs under accelerated review prove dangerous enough to have a black box warning or to be withdrawn. Um, that's really very high. Um, and that's compared to a, a mere 9.7% of all the other drugs approved, which strikes me as pretty high as well. Um, new biologicals are considered to be safer because they're more natural, but an important study done by uh, colleagues I got to know uh, in, in Utrecht when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study there, uh, published an important article in JAMA showing that um, they're, they're not safer, um, partly because, and they describe in detail, all the complexities involved in, in doing biologicals. 14% uh, resulted in formal actions taken in the first three years and 29% in the first 10 years. Um, first in class biologicals were 3.7 times more risky than biologicals within their class. So the ones that might be regarded as more breakthrough are also more dangerous. Now, why is this epidemic happening? Uh, in a word, many new drugs uh, approved every year have few advantages and greater risks based on trust that we have in the FDA and pharmaceutical companies. Um, and I think another major reason is that by the latest estimates, $57 billion is spent um, on, um, on persuading physicians to prescribe in ways other than they would prescribe if all those visits and money were not spent on them. Otherwise, why would you bother? Uh, most new drugs are developed to replace products going off patent, not to improve health. So before um, industry made the FDA change its rating system of the quality of new drugs, uh, the FDA rated drugs in the, in the, uh, from the mid, uh, from the early 60s to um, the mid 70s, 2.1% uh, as having, uh, being therapeutically significant, and another 8.6 is model, modestly superior. That is to say that eight out of nine new drugs were not therapeutically superior, or, or um, about 11%. That figure was supported by an industry-initiated study in Europe called the Barrel Report, which took me a year and a half to get. It was very, no one had it. Libraries didn't have it. I couldn't find it anywhere. I finally, actually, a, a neighbor of ours who worked for uh, Ron Poulin had a friend send it in a plain brown envelope. And this reminded me of earlier research I did in East Germany uh, <laughs> when I would get <laughs> mailings like, like that. But anyway, it arrived in a plain brown envelope to my house, and uh, there was the barrel report, the famous barrel report, that 
was always referred to by the industry as showing how innovative their, their, their drugs were, but when you actually read it, um, uh, and this is something I find time and again, that um, the executive summaries often don't tell you what's in the text. If you actually look at the data, it's not supported by the executive summaries. Um, <laughs> detailed assessments of all new drugs from 92 to 2006 found only 2.7 seven um, percent significantly better and 11 percent somewhat better or one in seven so things are improving it used to be one in nine now it's one in seven and this is a detailed count of all of those drugs and you can see how small the numbers are in the top two and three rows now companies select five to ten times more of those drugs to to as their final candidates to put into trials so that means that only 1.4 to 2.8 percent of all the drugs that the companies are putting forward as their best candidates um, are, offer significant therapeutic advantages. And I find that uh, a remarkable kind of estimate. I think that one of the main drivers is that gross profits on new drugs, uh, patented drugs, is between 96 and 99 percent. Um, because uh, new, uh, patented drugs are priced at 25 to 100 times their ex factory costs. And we have, uh, despite all of this information being highly proprietary, there are a few detailed examples uh, where we've been able to, to track uh, pricing and costs in great detail. And WHO now has an international uh, data set on pricing. Um, I think one of the main things is that, is that pharmaceutical executives deal routinely in high risk and, in, and, then, and sending drugs out and seeing what happens. And this is an old story. It goes all the way back to the beginning and continues on through the 20th century story about um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, costs are regarded as, uh, the cost of adverse reactions are regarded as a business expense and are budgeted. Um, and then there's an effort to assure and appease the patient. So Merck's motto, uh, as it was selling Vioxx, um, by far the most um, uh, deadly drug ever issued uh, in the history of pharmaceuticals, killed far more people than thal thalidomide, was putting patients first. Um, Bill Tarzan, who's the head of pharma, he was a congressman and then he, he set up Part D and then got a, an extra uh, boost in his income by going over to be the head of the trade association. Um, constantly argues, as you will see in today's webpage of pharma, that innovative drugs save lives. But of course, most drugs don't save lives. They can't because they're not drugs for life-threatening disorders. Um, and only one or two per hundred might extend life of, ser of the seriously ill for a few weeks or a few months. So the number of additional lives saved um, by new drugs per year uh, must be very small. And the large profits are also the driver be behind thousands of clinical trials in developing countries around which there is a, a rich and disturbing literature by ethicists and anthropologists and others um, about the lack of informed consent and ways in which people in developing countries are exploited. There are many, many trials that are not scientifically valid. They, they, are, they are not uh, powered properly. They don't have the proper designs and they're not used for submission to regulators. So um, now I wanna turn to um, an, an institutional effort to try to understand what's going on. And I call it the risk proliferation syndrome. This is a set of nine drivers that it seems to me maximize the number of people who are exposed to, um, to the risks of drugs that uh, often are, are not much better or no better according to independent evaluators. The first one is having companies design and pay for trials of their own drugs to be reviewed by regulators um, at great cost and with great conflict of interest. And there's a, a very uh, interesting and, and disturbing literature um, by trialists about badly designed trials or the ways in which trials can be directly or indirectly designed to 
um, do exactly what any sensible company would want to do, and that is maximize the evidence that their drugs are effective and minimize evidence that there are harms. So um, one is to choose endpoints that are most likely to succeed and then market broadly after approval for unapproved uses, which undermines the whole trustworthiness of the FDA system. And the second is to choose only selected safety indicators and not report on others. Uh, amazingly, Vioxx, even though it was known before any trials existed that it had uh, uh, um, uh, adverse effects on, on, uh, on, on, on the heart system, did not uh, measure and have in its design um, uh, 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 signs of, of cardiothoracic problems. Then randomly se selecting a biased healthy population, excluding elderly, excluding women, minorities, and people with co comorbidities. Um, healthy men are really a great, great group to sample. Uh, <laughs> run trials that are short enough to pick up the main effects, but not long enough to pick up the side effects, which usually take longer. Um, then maximizing the dose to maximize the main effect uh, without detecting, so you those two get combined. And then not counting dropouts. You count dropouts as having dropped out, but uh, not uh, following through to see why they did. And often it's because of the adverse effects of the drugs they were taking, which they couldn't stand to take anymore. Um, and then companies manage the analysis and write-up of the results. And that's the whole literature around ghost writing and, and around um, when there's not ghost writing, uh, sponsored trials have been systematic reviews showing that, um, that uh, company sponsored trials are, I think it's 3.5 times more likely to conclude uh, something positive about the product than independently funded trials. So the Cochrane Center analysis regards company sponsorship as a key variable in the prediction of positive results. Um, the FDA label is written by the company and uh, as a recent uh, article in the New, New England Journal of Medicine uh, documented, uh, often omits clear evidence of harms and even deaths. The second uh, part of the risk proliferation syndrome is um, efficacy measured against placebo. Um, I don't know about your neighbors, but all of my neighbors who are pretty, you know, pretty intelligent, switched on people, think that better means better than what we have now. And more effective means more effective than what we have now. Uh, but if you ask better than what, it'll be better than an inert substance, uh, more effective than an inert substance. And uh, this decision was made in 1962 after the Kefauver hearings and the major reforms that efficacy would be defined as better than or even non-inferior to placebo. Um, so I think it's a root cause of the fact that most drugs over the past 45 years have offered little gain over existing drugs. It's also, there's another fascinating literature about the ways in which that has spawned um, kind of new models of, of disease, new models of risks and so forth, um, where surrogate uh, endpoints can be used to do better than placebo and therefore you can get a drug approved. And once you get it approved, then you turn over the marketing department and, and, the, and, and things can, can take off from there. So an example that we've been watching and has come kind of to the end of part of its story uh, recently is the model that um, high cholesterol causes uh, heart disease and lower cholesterol will prevent heart disease. Another is that shrinking cancer tumors and other surrogate side effect reduces death from cancer. And a third, we can discuss these all after, after I finish, um, the serotonin model of major depression and the whole uh, generation of SSRI drugs, which now have been pretty thoroughly uh, discredited as, as a breakthrough group of drugs, um, especially after uh, investigators uh, got all the unpublished trials and, and combined all the unpublished data with all the published data, it changed the whole balance of the results um, down close to uh, placebo. The third is intellectual property protections regardless of health benefits. Um, and as you may know, there's, there are whole groups of professors of law like Larry Lessig, who, who now is at that other place in Boston or in Cambridge, um, but was one of your great law professors here before he 
he you know, sort of went to the boonies in Boston. Uh, <laughs> um, independent of pharmaceuticals, um, making a strong case that patents no longer do what patents were originally intended to do, and Ben Franklin came up with the idea that they're actually an obstacle to, uh, to innovation. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting studies about, uh, it actually it's a sub-business now to buy up, for example, a patented lab technique, and then to write all the labs and say, um, we believe you're violating my, <laughs> my patent. And of course, they don't really know. It's a general letter. Um, and we will take you to court in two and a half months. Uh, on the other hand, you could send us a check for $25,000, and uh, we would give you a 50-year license, uh, that kind of uh, patent blackmail. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that happens is that monopoly prices, as I said, are about 25 to 100 times manufacturing costs, especially for cancer and, and, and AIDS drugs. And yet the net median research cost to companies is lower for those than for drugs for hay fever or high cholesterol. Uh, I have not seen any objective evidence yet why cancer drugs should cost any more than Lipitor. Um, I'm sure there are some, there are some of them ha are more complicated in terms of manufacturing. Certainly some of them have much smaller um, um, volume of sales. But uh, the R&D rationale, which is the key rationale in Washington, uh, as far as I know, is contradicted by what data we have. Of course, it would be nice if they would share their data since um, it's, these are social goods that are for the betterment of humankind and largely paid for by public money. Um, and so there's a very strong incentive to focus your research on follow-on follow variants of existing um, drugs or come up with with uh, slight changes in the molecule. The textbook case is Nexium as simply a, uh, a splitting of the Prilosec molecule um, and then selling it so that it generates $3 billion a year in sales when actually nobody really needs it. Um, and there's a huge profit in creating demand for unapproved uses. Uh, in the forthcoming book on this subject that we're doing, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, talks about menopause and the menopause story of the 50s and 60s when there was this huge campaign to persuade women that menopause was kind of a form of rotting and it made you uh, more susceptible to heart disease and cancer and also looking old and so you really should take hormone replacement therapy which in, in time was proven to be more dangerous than beneficial. Um, so one has a government protected market that pays monopoly prices for new products in a way that doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, could Toyota or Nokia or Apple uh, improve last year's model and triple the price? And you know, would you buy it? Uh, would anyone buy it? So value-based value pricing is very scarce in this particular world. Uh, and the industry comes back with, as it has every year for the last 40 years, if you lower our prices, you and yours will suffer and die because if you lower your prices, um, it will reduce R&D and then innovative new drugs, which we've already learned are usually not terribly innovative and not better, um, will not be discovered and developed and sold. Uh, the, uh, uh, the most interesting comment I've heard about that is from someone, a uh, financial senior uh, writer who covers high-tech industries. And he says, you know, every other high-tech industry redoubles its R&D if sales are down or profits are off. It's the only way they might regain market share and profitability. So isn't this really a bluff? Um, anyway, the new 12-year market exclusivity that now is you know, before Congress um, uh, what is being promoted with no evidence that it benefits, um, that it increases innovation or benefits anybody except the companies. A fourth driver is that medical journals are so drug dependent um, there are extensive multi-pronged ways in which, uh, which pharma pharmaceutical companies influence the submissions, the reviews, and the publishing of journal articles. Um, journals have a rule that all ads in journals um, must be relevant to the practice of medicine. There was a really interesting uh, suggestion in PLOS Medicine that that should be switched around. I mean, that is actually why they're so drug dependent. So you could turn it around and say, 
no ads in the New England Journal of Medicine shall be relevant to the practice of medicine. So you have ads for Lexuses and vacations and, and condos and sailboats and okay, I mean, these sort of like the New Yorker ads. And actually the, the ad rate charge is, is equally high. Um, and then they would be drug independent. Um, about, then they make about a 90% gross profit on reprints and if it's a, an article with positive findings, the company will buy a lot of them and you make a lot of money right away. If it's a negative finding, uh, the company won't buy any of them and you won't make any money on reprints. Uh, in the case of uh, Vioxx, Merck paid $900,000 just for reprints of the 2000 uh, study that was then used to mislead doctors and create the worst drug disaster in history. Fifth, uh, industry controls medical knowledge and education to a very worrisome degree. The extensive influence on physician education, um, the ways in which industry staff and, and medical writers are the main source of news information and news stories, um, the construction of accounts and narratives of our bodies and our pathologies, um, a great anthropologist uh, got a, a, a senior, uh, senior fellowship from the American uh, Advertising Council to, um, to uh, hang around the, the halls of, of Gray, which is one of the great uh, advertising companies. And what she, she was blown away with was how much anthropology they knew. They were really terrific cultural anthropologists and they know how to construct accounts and narratives and stories about any of the worries and hopes that you might imagine would, might sell more drugs. And the industry is allowed to swamp regulators. So the, the in, in, in Inspector General's report of 2003 found that FDA reviewers met 23 times with their scientific advisory groups and 1,021 times with company officials. I, it's just overwhelming. Um, and FDA uh, officers repeatedly override their own scientific staff there have been articles about that in the last month, about overrides. Uh, and then they exclude them from critical meetings and exclude the evidence from critical meetings. So there is a real management technical staff uh, divide there. Seventh, companies fund the FDA for speed up reviews. We've mentioned that uh, already quickly. And um, eighth, um, immediate mass marketing is allowed even though everyone, the companies, the FDA, the medical profession, everyone agrees that at the point of approval, information on the safety of new drugs is quite partial and quite limited. And there are a few places like France that are, uh, and a number of uh, concerned policy uh, people in the United States, mainly physicians, who recommend that, that for the first two years, any new drug should only be prescribed for the approved use, no unapproved usage, and that those prescriptions should be monitored and tracked so that one gets much more rigorous evidence uh, in a normal, po a normal population of both the benefits and the harms of that new drug. Um, but that's not what happens at all, uh, but it could. And it makes doctors into sort of double agents. So first, they prescribe new drugs with greater risks than advantages as the pa patient's trusted agent then they're more likely to dismiss complaints of toxic side effects as the patient's trusted advisor. And I have all of these documented and footnoted in the, in the paper behind this presentation. Um, and, and then uh, when lawsuits occur, the drug companies uh, put it, stick it to the doctors. They say, well, we didn't prescribe the drug. We just talked talk to them. That's all we did and gave them some literature. Um, it's, it's the doctors who prescribed it, so why are you suing us? Um, and, it all, and then uh, directed consumer advertising strikes me that it, it, it makes doctors into bartenders. So you say, well, I'd like a, a Bacardi mojito. You know, I'd like a Lipitor statin. Um, it's kind of like, you know, ask your doctor if, uh, if Bacardi or Lipitor is good for you. Um, uh, nine, it, is the expansion and creation of health risk conditions and diseases, the whole um, um, proliferation of, as we are getting healthier, of more worries and concerns. Um, the proliferation of mild psychiatric conditions. There are some terrific books showing that uh, uh, almost all of the non-psychotic diagnostic categories in the DSM-3, 3R, and 4 
uh, have almost no scientific basis for them. Um, then having panelists with industry ties lower the thresholds for high blood pressure, cholesterol, and other uh, uh, clinical conditions. Um, the exaggeration of high cholesterol is a cause of heart disease. And I mentioned menopause, and there are many other examples. Um, and this is an old story, so one could tell stories from earlier decades, as probably Phil could do. So I, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that the US government systematically endangers millions of people to maximize the profits of the pharmaceutical industry. It does not fund the FDA fully as an independent regulator of the industry to monitor, test, and, 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 and follow up on drugs. The post-marketing surveillance is really very weak. Um, it allows extensive influence peddling by industry um, and allows the FDA officers to override their experts, and that's been going on for 35 years. And it uses taxpayers' money to pay um, billions for new drugs of, of poor value and higher risk, uh, an extraordinary percentage of, for example, Medicaid part, Medicare Part D money goes to such drugs. Um, and the same with the EU. So my question I wanted to end asking is, why do you think this risk proliferation syndrome exists and persists? Why do companies keep biasing science, tainting universities, commercializing clinical judgment, or endang and endangering patients? Or am I really just excessively upset over something that's really not that much of a problem? So I'd like to. Uh, Pose that as a question. Thank you. If I could play biological devil's advocate for a second. Yes. Um, and this is totally anecdotal, not based on much of anything. Humans are variable. So there's a lot of individual variation yes. in our metabolisms and all kinds of things. Yes. And this, as a leap of logic, could mean that drugs that might not be necessarily superior in an overall test, because the test is looking at the means, not at the variances, uh, could actually be more helpful than the drug on the market for some subset of the people. Right. And what prompted me to think about this was allergy drugs, for example, yes. in which in my own experience there are some that work for some of my friends that do absolutely nothing for me yeah. and vice versa. So I'm wondering whether or not there's a way to incorporate human variability into the thoughts about whether or not approved drugs may not have an overall mean superiority yeah. but still serve a function by addressing individual human variation. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really good question. Well, um, that observation is the is the driving uh, rationale behind what's called personalized medicine and the whole idea of developing of, of trying to figure out exactly what those subpopulations are, how they differ, and then developing um, more boutique or custom uh, aim drugs for them. Um, it's uh, in the, in the pharmaceutical literature, like uh, Nature Pharmaceuticals, it's the dream of having uh, uh, 10 times as many blockbuster drugs, um, each priced at 10 or $20,000 a year, so that you know, your hay fever is taken care of by this drug and your hay fever by that drug. Um, it, that hasn't gotten very far, but it's still very much uh, uh, talked about and and uh, hope for and the genome project was supposed to bring this about very quickly, but people are pretty disappointed about that. Um, now, if we look at it not from that point of view, but from a pragmatic point of view, uh, that's a good reason and a common argument for having a second, third, or fourth drug in a class. Um, there's been, I think, some pretty good writing about uh, evidence really questioning a fifth, sixth, or seventh drug in a class. But two, three, or four um, probably is quite helpful that way. It's also true, by the way, of the side effects. So adverse side effects also will be by subpopulations for various kinds of genetic, biological, and conditional variabilities. Um, the trialing is not generally done that way. 
Uh, we have a major new development in, in England. The National Health Service has set aside about a billion dollars to do its own trials of whatever doctors want to find out about, okay? oh, about drugs. And it's uh, being run by a friend of mine, Tom Wally, who's, a, who's a, a, a considered one of the country's best uh, um, uh, uh, trialists and, and, and scientists. Um, and so I suspect um, they will be doing some of these studies. The, the industry um, has not been doing very many of those. Um, so, I mean, it's, a, it's clearly a valid observation. Um, it's it's uh, a very strong rhetoric, but not a very, isn't striving the reality too much. Uh, reality is to put all of them out there and say they're good for everybody and let people figure out which one is best for you and which one's best for your friend. Uh, I think Barbara was separate. Thanks, Don. That was really a lucid summary and very concise. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that our entire quality of care enterprise fosters this climate of increasing drug use and different drug use. Because um, there's a guidelines. Guidelines say that physicians have to get laboratory values to certain levels. And that's going to increase the use of more and more drugs and some new drugs that haven't been proven. And the other thing that increases it is our um, notion that diseases are what causes ill health. When in fact it's not so clear that, um, that our, the diseases that we consider diseases are unique biologic entities the way we used to think they were. Because there's now lots of comorbidities, cardiopulmonary cardia. Um, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, used to be thought of disease. It's now known as a systemic syndrome. Our whole notion of diseases is changing and therefore the basis for the use of drugs. And we're paying physicians now to make diagnoses and use these drugs to get laboratory values to certain levels when it doesn't necessarily relate to health or prognosis in individuals. So it's just this, there's a whole chain of events that really predisposes to using more and more drugs with no evidence of benefit. You were next. Yeah, there, uh, just one comment. There, there's a, an interesting article I saw recently um, by a sociologist looking, kind of looking as you are at the landscape, saying, are we moving from disease to risk profile? Is, is the sort of notion, the, the whole disease language fading away and being replaced by risk factors and risk profile. Yeah. Um, so I absolutely agree that um, the evidence on hiding of adverse events uh, at selective trials of location uh, is extremely worrying. One part that I'm actually, uh, that of your talk, which I would hope that you would comment on, is, so for example, David Cutler makes the argument that um, Yes, we've paid more and more for healthcare, but it's it's worth it because you know you might start out paying ten thousand dollars per unit of uh, of value, but really your your threshold for where you want where you'd be willing to pay is like hundred thousand. So yes, the marginal benefit of each additional new thing goes down, but we're still very much uh, within where we're willing to pay. Yeah. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious: are, are you arguing that? there is diminishing benefit to new drugs discovered or, or, uh, or, or that there's no benefit? Oh, no, I, I, I said I think quite clearly that um, about um, 11 to 14 percent of new drugs um, prove to provide substantial therapeutic advantage. So, and that's, um, and I think I, I made it clear there's about 40 years of pretty consistent evidence by different people doing similar kinds of studies that that's been the rate for a long time, which, by the way, reframes what's known now as the innovation crisis. So the innovation crisis, as framed now in the business literature and the pharmaceutical literature, is about the paucity of new molecules that get approved. Um, that kind of, that's revealing what their agenda is. If your agenda is to help patients be healthier, um, then the innovation crisis is very much older and, and much more pervasive. 
Um, so I, on, on your question about diminishing, I don't see any evidence of, of diminishing. What I see is a, um, uh, I think there's some pretty simple solutions to, um, to what should be done to make drugs safer and more effective. I mean, the first thing to do is to have m more or ideally all of the new drugs more effective so there's more, so that every new drug has offsetting benefits to the risks. Okay, that's the first thing to do. I mean, the problem now is there's so many new drugs that have substantial risks without any offsetting benefits. So the risk-benefit ratio is, is uh, you know, or let's say the benefit-risk ratio is, is negative. Um, and uh, that would be easy to do by just having drugs that have to be tested against existing drugs, uh, both for, for um, therapeutic advantages and, and also often for reducing side effects. So some better drugs are not necessarily, don't have a better main effect, but they are, they have fewer adverse effects. And that's overall on balance beneficial as well. Yeah. I'd like to follow up on that because this issue of marginal benefits is something that gets to an issue that you didn't really touch upon, in which being a physician and a sociologist, I get to see in practice, which is belief systems, widely held institutionalized public belief systems that are not based in scientific evidence and yet have the rule of law. And it has to do with patients that I've seen. One, there was antibiotic, two, two drugs. One was the newer brand and one was the older uh, generic. And I knew from the research that the only advantage of the newer brand was convenience. But no, and I refused to prescribe it. And had the patient yell at me, have the pharmacist yell at me, and finally get my boss to yell at me, and my boss wrote a prescription for the new one to avoid a complaint. And a second one about cholesterol drug A versus cholesterol drug B, when I suggested to a patient who happened to be a professor of economics at in this institution, that the choice was one of marginal cost, marginal benefit. And he slammed his fist down and he said, this has nothing to do with marginal cost, marginal benefit. He said, with HMOs, they have the right to keep it from that drug. There are <laughs> several deeply held belief systems in the public that focusing on regulatory changes how do you change belief systems that are, are that deeply held by the public? Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, certainly a, a, a major part of the, of the proliferation risk syndrome is, <clears throat> which the industry uh, has a, a very strong uh, grip on, is the creation of, of um, narratives and rationales and rhetorics um, to promote that. And it's much easier for a physician to, and takes much less time to give them what they want. I mean, imagine if you asked for Bacardi Mojito and the bartender started saying, well, you really want a Ron Rico Mojito. I mean, you know, Bacardi's not as good. <laughs> and you say, well, you're absolutely wrong. You know, I, I mean, I know it's better because I saw it on television. So um, there's that, there's also the time hassle factor, even, even if the patient weren't yelling at you. I can't imagine any patient yelling at you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're too nice. I can't, I just, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you must have been one of your bad days. This gentleman and then. It seems like a marginal benefit is such a thing. Um, I'm a pediatrician in the Navy and just teaching from that. It is helpful to describe more than we do. But, um, you know, if I see a patient, Especially if the side effects that are listed 
and have been tested are minimal. Um, oh, that yeah, particular sure. Compound. And then also, yeah. I'm wondering if we can, you know, maybe play the pharmaceutical companies against the HMOs, because, you know, when the HMOs write me a letter and say, we're not covering this drug, because you haven't tried X, Y, Z, well, uh, maybe that in itself could be a regulator to the inflating costs. Mm, interesting. Uh, a couple thoughts come to mind. I mean, um, the your phrase "give it a try" is, is another, you know, a totally different mindset. It's much more British, where I spent a lot of time, and and it seems much more sensible than than mass marketing. Uh, and um, if you really want to read something that's quite disturbing, read uh, Congressman Henry Waxman's 23-page summary of the, all the marketing material that they subpoenaed from Merck. And the details move by move. Every time that some independent source um, publicized the heart attacks and strokes from Vioxx, uh, Merck redoubled its marketing and said it was all untrue. Starting with the front page of the New York Times in 2001, uh, by which time uh, it was clear to anyone who wanted to, to spend, I don't know, an hour that uh, Vioxx should be withdrawn from the market. And after that, about 100,000 people uh, um, had heart attack strokes or sudden death before it was withdrawn in 2004. Uh, anyway, the other thing that comes to mind is uh, Sir Ian Chalmers, the founder of the Cochrane Centers, who's a friend of mine, uh, has been strongly urging recently um, that, uh, that when, dr when drugs are tested, we should start by asking the patient. So, you know, if I don't understand the diseases you're studying, but if two stools versus ten stools is something that really matters to the patient, you know, Ian's point is that should be one of the hard, hard clinical endpoints. You know, ask patients, what is it that you would like to have a drug do? What, what, thing, you know, what parts of this disease and your suffering and pain would you like to have addressed? And have trialists make those, the answers to that the... The, the criteria for testing. And uh, that hasn't yet been picked up, but uh, Tom is a good friend of Ian's, and so maybe things will happen at least in Ian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I think there's somebody over there first. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you were next. I'm sorry. Seems sorry. to me that two things I would question are one, patient available information. My doctor tells me I should take Flibobliblock. I would like to go to govmedicine.gov and find yes. out what yes. the test results are. Secondly, yes. my physician says take Flibobliblock. Yes. I would like to go to that site and say Flibobliflip is half the price. Yes. And go to Medicare and say give me yes. half of the savings. Oh, <laughs> so that I I have hey. a negative benefit, or I have I'm rewarded for picking the generic. If I decide after talking to my doctor that I want to do it, let's see if I understand. So you want American taxpayers to reward you for being a smart shopper, right? Because okay, I just, what I'm saying I'm is, sure I got this straight. What I'm saying is Medicare <laughs> or the health insurance or whatever. Yes, we'll cover something. I understand. What I'm saying is if I can save them money, yeah. I should get half the savings. Yeah, 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 I understand. That okay, way, let me, let me address the, individual. Right. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but let me address the first part. Okay. It seems to me it wouldn't be that hard to create a, a center for the use of safe and effective drugs, or some name like that, because the data are already there they can be assembled without too much difficulty into um, what someone has called in Boston uh, drug fact boxes, a, a little summary box um, that anyone could go to and any, anyone could read. The closest thing we have to that, I don't know if everyone here knows that, that consumers uh, report um, about five years ago uh, added a whole new section to their testing of cars and televisions and cameras and cell phones and whatever else consumer union tests. And you know they're, they're ferociously independent. They will take no government money 
uh, as well as no, no uh, industry money. Um, and, and now um, uh, systematically tests new drugs. Well, they don't do it, but there is, uh, the United States does have something like Prescure International in France. It does have one independently funded um, uh, objective, rigorous group at the Oregon Health Sciences University that uh, uh, um, assesses the evidence on the, on the relative benefits and harms of new drugs and issues reports on those. And then consumers report, um, which is called Best Buy Drugs. If you put Best Buy Drugs in Google or Bing, you'll get it. And it gives you head-to-head, -head, side by side comparisons of main effects, side effects, and price. And it has their little flag, Best Buy, by the drugs that they think um, are, the, are the best buy. But you can buy any others as well. And they have a minimum amount of advice. Um, it, it's pretty good. It's not bad. It's, uh, it has its critics. Um, but it's not, not bad at all. Oh, let's see. Phil, yeah, just one, and then a couple things. You. One, I think your thesis is absolutely correct. And if you go back, I mean, when Milton and I first got involved in this, it was in 67. And so it's been, you know, it's 40 years. Uh, and nobody has done anything about it on the adverse drug reactions, for example. The IOM put out a kind of a couple of reports but did nothing. Uh, Congress uh, in the 90s, of course, said the drug companies will pay for new drug applications because they wouldn't appropriate money for the FDA to be an independent agency. Uh, so the unwillingness of Congress to fund the FDA adequately, several things happened as a result of that. One, there was more emphasis on the new drug applications and David Kessler was commissioner who was interested in tobacco. Uh, so food safety suffered, and all the rest of the FDA, in a sense, didn't flourish. And then subsequent to that, of course, it's gotten even worse. Yeah. Uh, so that the, the corrective actions that you've suggested, seems to me, are critically important. Yeah. But you go back and say, why is this? Why does the public trust the drug company? When we go back to the sulfur drugs, yeah. then penicillin, they didn't attribute that to you know, anybody's research, although it was people at Oxford who actually did the clinical trials who yes. demonstrated. And then the US government yeah. invested, but it was the drug companies then that produced it and made it available on very large Well, actually, the scale. government built the factories well, for the short list of drug companies, four companies which were one. not really interested in producing penicillin. Uh, they no. had to kind of they twist their them. arm and say, yeah. well, look, we'll build you a whole factory and sell it back to you for one-fifth of what it cost the American taxpayer to get them going. There were big tanks yeah. that they had to build. Yeah. But then there were other advances, like antihypertensive drugs, that gave the public a lot of confidence in the drug companies. Of course, the income, the profit of the drug companies has been among the best of any industry, at least for the last 40 years. So you've got those resources and then the partnership with the universities on graduate medical education, on residency. You know, they fund pizzas for residents and med students and the, the payoffs. Stanford currently is by far the best med school with respect to conflict of interest between industry and the med school mm -hmm. faculties. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. Pennsylvania is well behind UCSF, I'm sad to say, is behind. So there's, you've got to change federal policy. You've got, and of course, you look at Obama administration makes a deal with the drug companies. They are not going to have the government in Medicare negotiate with the drug companies. Uh, and they say they'll make $80 billion for the, but for the drug companies, they'll probably make $500 billion or more as a result of not well, having those negotiations. Those so there's a number yeah. of, we have to do it at the university level. We have to do it at, but particularly the FDA, but we also have to have the policymakers not make these kind of deals. And of course, the drug companies are now the biggest medical lobby. Uh, they are in favor of health care reform. Yes. So I think it's likely it's going to pass because so many congressmen depend on the drug company money for their campaigns. I mean, it's, it's very... Monday's Time magazine Money says that the, that the drug companies have been averaging 
$609,000 a day on lobbying to a selected number of congressmen. Yeah. So it's a huge well, amount. That's their daily, the that's their daily budget that. for lobbying, $609,000 a day. Well, a couple of things come to mind. There's a one, the, the best history of the FDA, I think, is by Hiltz, H-I-L-T-S. Yes. And he has a very nice chapter about the 80s. And yes. so it would be a slight variation of your story, which is relevant to everybody. And that is the way in which um, Congress um, uh, actually reduced the budget and then refused to increase the budget of the FDA through the 80s. So it kind of starved the FDA, FDA to a point of desperation. Yes. Um, and then um, turn it over to the industry to, to pay large fees, 100% of which originally, and now 90 and 85 and 80% of which go to the division that reviews new drugs. And, and originally nothing and now a little bit for safety. Um, I, I guess I chose this focus because it seems to me that um, aside from uh, other issues that I've studied, which is the cost of R&D and the, and the price of drugs and other kinds of more economic issues, um, there's nothing that is more profoundly relevant than, than uh, whether they're safe or not. Yes. So we're advertising. We're the only country except, again, except New Zealand. New Zealand. But the, the influence on physicians is even more damaging than direct consumer advertising. But at least if we have physician disclosure laws that are coming up, then we'll be able to track that versus... But isn't this because we believe in free speech, Phil? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, do you want well, to deny free yeah. speech to these? Mm -hmm. the, the Supreme Court would probably rule against you. Exactly. No, but on direct consumer advertising, so, you might be able to deal with that. Hmm, I wonder how. Anyway, it's interesting. I think I'm just warning you to suggest that in the legislation that's being passed, individual patients will be able to go online and see if their own doctor is getting um, consulting money from the drug companies and to see whether the drug they just got prescribed is from the company that he's getting paid for or she's getting paid for. So that's, that uh -huh. very good step. Don, another thing you didn't mention. Yes. The National Center for Health Statistics has not really gathered data on oh, adverse no. drug reactions. Now, of course, physicians won't report them because of the liability <laughs> issues, but even yeah, we recommended point. really 40 years ago that this be done. It's never happened. See. Thank you. Yeah. Didn't so it doesn't that. count as one I of didn't the mention major because I didn't know it. Yeah, it's not <laughs> Thank as you. one of the major decisions. <laughs> yes. You sort of discussed the America, uh, America. One of the other questions I have is can we go around our situation? Can I get the information from Britain or France so that I oh. can get a different style of Yeah, you can. My, the, the point of my previous comment is it wouldn't be hard to get that all together in, 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 a, in a reasonably accessible way. But yes, if you, if you have a certain persistence, you can go to the Australian board and, and their, all of their assessments of new drugs are fully reported including the reasoning for why they approved it or partially approved it and, and how they came up with the price they did. Same with the New Zealand board. The Scottish board is also available. So I can and and they're, they're all in English. I could suggest consumers gather this together in this Best Buy website. Yeah, right. And it would be interesting to compare. Um, the, the German board has very good stuff, but it's all in German. Um, so, and, oh, and Prescreer is wonderful. Prescreer is not only um, uh, so um, sort of uh, rigorous and detailed, but they have a wonderful sense of sort of French humor. Um, so it's a delight to read. Um, nice, a nice report, sir. Right? And the nice and report, I'm sorry, of course, the nice reports, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in London um, issues reports, but they don't do every drug. I mean, for these others do sort of every drug that is proposed to go on the market. NICE sort of picks its shots about what's important. And they study a lot of other things. So, um, but they do very, a very good job. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I'm sorry if you addressed this earlier, but um, uh, I'm a pulmonary critical care fellow, so I'm sort of still a physician in training. 
What I was struck by when I entered medical school is the concept of scaling up when we talk about therapy for a patient. We're never taught to scale down, that if something isn't working, we should reconsider, is our approach even valid? That's what we're taught is, and even having just taken a bunch of board exams also, <laughs> the, way, the way that they ask you question is, the person has failed X, Y, and Z. What will you add next? That is always the question. It's never, it's never, what would you keep off? Or what would you talk to them about maybe discontinuing? And so I think patients get used to that system where certainly more is better. And I can tell you the only population or patients in my clinic who don't follow that are patients, usually of East Asian descent, where they typically associate, um, they don't necessarily have the, the more is better attitude. And I think that that's something we can address in medical schools where we, yeah. if I had to go back, maybe we could teach a course on scaling down, not just scaling down. That's a great observation. It sounds like a wonderful essay you should write. I mean, I know you have a lot of spare time. <laughs> you know, this weekend, what are you going to do Saturday and Sunday? You should write it. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I have one other comment, and yeah. that is about Congress. The FDA is regulated by the Agriculture Committee, not the Health Committee. So that uh, it's not policy, it's not public health oriented. FDA, in fact, is one of the major public health agencies in the Department of Health and Human Services. But the process of decision making goes to the Agriculture Committee, not the Health Committee. So Waxman can do everything he wants, but he has no direct influence over either the appropriations for FDA or the substantive That's content. And you've made recommendations about FDA that I think are critically important and absolutely right on target. So who are the key um, congressmen for agriculture? Who's the chairman uh, currently? Yeah, yeah, of the yeah. ag I don't know who I don't know either. Harkin. I hadn't thought of it this way. Tom yeah. Harkin, maybe. Tom Harkin. That's really interesting. Thank you. I did, I'm learning all kinds of things from you today. There's a hand up over here. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, I this is all to me. I've not really done direct research on the industry, but I'm probably the only person in the room who has direct industry experience. Uh -huh. And um, I can't imagine an industry that is so highly regulated. It is incredibly difficult to even promote a drug without going through all different levels of with the agency, and um, you know, I can't speak to the veracity of the data, the clinical data. I mean, the clinical endpoints are usually discussed with the principal investigators and, yes. and whatnot. And usually, they do relate to efficacy of the disease, for instance, with Crohn's, the CVI score, and you know, some of it is included in symptoms, and some of them are markers that uh, relate to efficacy of the disease. Um, I, I think that, I think we have to at least have a fair balance of view that <laughs> perhaps there is really um, uh -huh. some benefit to the drugs that are being uh, used in our, you know, to maintain our health. Well, there are two or three points you've made. So take the last one. Um, there, there are, as I said, um, a few drugs every year and cumulatively cumulatively a lot of drugs over many years that are clearly beneficial. Um, and we are very much the better uh, for those. Um, it's uh, all the others, and, uh, and, and, I, and to turn to your first point, the marketing that is consistently found to be misleading. So for example, the GAO report on marketing materials shows that uh, on one hand, you're right, companies have to submit their marketing information to the FDA, but the FDA has um, something like seven staff to review 150,000 submissions, and so um, the FGAO found they basically don't review anything. Uh, they don't have the time or the or the resources, and and uh, the companies having uh, you know sent something in the mail or by FedEx, um, then can proceed because unless they are they get a letter saying not to. Um, that, you know, they don't, they don't need prior approval. They just need to submit it, and then it's a, the theory is it will be reviewed to be objective and fair, da da da. But there are actually no people to do it, 
and, um, and the industry is not in its uh, funding of the FDA, is not funding that department either. So, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, the, the evidence of, by an objective uh, study pretty recently, about a year and a half ago, um, it con you know, contradicts what you said. And then Perscreer did a 15-year study uh, in the field uh, of a sample of physicians about um, the degree to which uh, reps uh, did or did not mention side effects which the, uh, which the physicians knew about. And they consistently found that they didn't mention them, which is perfectly understandable. I mean, the, the salaries and, and, and bonus structure uh, would probably lead me to understate the, you know, if that was my livelihood and I was sending a child to Stanford and had to pay standard tuition fees, um, I probably might understate the side effects as well. So, uh, but the labels yeah. do have oh, all the... No, no the labels do not have all the, which is why I mentioned that the, 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 this new New England Journal of Medicine piece, which details the way in which the companies, I mean, just imagine, it's just kind of shocking that you have an industry that's paying the regulator um, to, to uh, review its own biased trials, and then it writes the label for the regulator for society. Now, the whole idea of the FDA was to protect society from drug disasters which were perpetrated by unethical companies. So this whole history of us being so regulated is really around trying to deal with unethical behavior and not yet figuring out how to do it. And, and you know, this series of, of an article every other day in a major publication um, is, is evidence that um, companies continue to behave badly enough to be major news. So I, I, I yeah, yeah. You know, it's pretty strong evidence. I'm I can tell you that there are firewalls within industry, within uh -huh. research and development, those who are on the regulatory side and those who are on the, the commercial side. And um, you know, they do, um, there, there are definitely a lot of restrictions on you know, any, and in fact, there are whistleblower you know, rewards for whistleblowers, too. Yeah. It, um, it's interesting that you just mentioned something, because there's some interesting literature about how the marketing departments are kept kind of separate from the research people and the regulatory people, um, and they from them. And I was at an international meeting in, in, um, in, in Amsterdam where one of the proposals was um, why don't we, uh, this is an a, a, a international pharmaceutical group um, who is kind of scientifically oriented, said, wonder if we had the scientists review the company's own marketing material, because they did the science and they did the trials, and so if the, mar if the scientists reviewed the marketing materials, wouldn't that lead to um, much higher quality and more uh, uh, accurate marketing materials? It's an interesting idea. Um, not that anyone's doing it. I think you're handling Yeah, I just uh, like to comment on that. I, I, as much as we are all in agreement and bemoaning the fact that the FDA is under research, there are lots of examples and lots of medications that are available in Europe that are not available here. Because they have, you shot No. Me. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah, tons of them. And some of them we have avoided. Oh. Disaster. When I wrote this in August, the, the, the pharma issued a blast against my article and said, and I, I will show it to you, it says, all the great new drugs come out in America first. Americans benefit from the new drugs. Those Europeans, you know, with their price control and their socialistic ideas, you know, they're suffering and dying. Anyway, go ahead. It was amazing. It was an amazing. It was an amazing blast. Uh, right. I sent it to Carol. So, no, as as a clinical practitioner as well, there's plenty of drugs that I know of, and I've worked in England for a while that are available in England that are not available here. And so, how? Sort of what is your feel for that? Because clearly, on one hand, you're saying, oh, the French and the Germans are so much better. But I, on one hand, I'm saying, yeah, but they approve more Me Too drugs than we do. There are, a, for example, there are uh, way more ACE inhibitors available in Europe than there are in the US. They're all Me Too drugs. It doesn't really matter. So, you know, on that hand, I would say, oh, they're actually doing worse on this front. How do, yeah, well, well, the European FDA, which is called EMEA, the European FDA is a very different and weaker model than the American FDA. Um, it doesn't have anywhere near the staff of scientifically trained reviewers that the FDA has. Um, it's also fully funded by industry fees, 
So the conflict of interest is equally great. Um, the Europeans, in some ways, may be getting their act together better, but it's, um, you know, the, the people I most respect who look across all the different regulatory and pharmaceutical markets think it's a mixed picture. Um, the, it's interesting that the blog comments um, to my August article included some people saying, um, well, the Europeans uh, are, are getting more serious about value for money, more serious about not paying more than a drug is, is better than, than existing drugs. So one of the big shocks a couple of years ago was when the, when, uh, you know, several years ago, so when the German board reviewed Lipitor, um, which uh, even, you know, even American accounts uh, indicate is only modestly better than other statins, and concluded it was only modestly better. So they said, well, we'll pay you a little bit more than generic price, because you have a drug that's only a little bit better. And, uh, and it, it, it was just, uh, the company was shocked that, that it would only be getting a little bit more than, than generic. So there's, and, and England is especially doing that with, with NICE. Um, and with these drugs that, uh, you know, we get the, the, the slanted view over here, the drugs that NICE decides are not worth funding are not worth funding because the prices are so high. The drugs are pretty good, but they're charging um, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year, they're mainly cancer drugs. And so Sir Michael Rollins has, is saying, well, how about lowering your price? And then, and then, you know, then we'll approve it. And that's beginning to happen. And as I said earlier, I see no reason why cancer drugs are so horrendously expensive. So let's see, yes, Bob, you next. Well, I, I think you made a lot of pertinent points, for instance, the idea that you should be testing things against the standard of practice rather than generics, but I think that buried in here is a lot of subtlety, and just sort of pulling, like I could pull numerous examples from my field, there are 20 some odd drugs for HIV, the majority of them are Me Too drugs, uh, however, there are six different classes of drugs. Each of those classes that come out may not be more efficacious than the existing class, but we need them because people become resistant to the other class, so we need to use them in combinations. We also need the Me Too drugs because they drive the price down for the ones that are already existing, and because if the same company makes two different types of drugs, they can actually put them in a combined pill, which they can't do otherwise. So although none of those drugs, most of the, I mean, you could say, we just need one, the most effective one, that would be just missing the point completely. We need all 20 of them. Uh, and now we found that at least some of them are not efficacious, but they boost the efficacy of other drugs. Yeah, uh, right. And so the subtle things that are involved here suggest that, and we can do the same thing with you know, drugs for flu. Okay, there are four drugs for flu, and there are two classes, so we need two classes. And two of them are need two drugs, but they differ in terms of uh, their, their resistance profiles, for instance. Yeah. Uh, they also, uh, again, have the competition factor, so you want at least two drugs from each class. So there's a lot of subtleties in, in the need for these drugs. Uh, in answer to your last question, I think it's trivial what's mo driving all this. It's money. So, uh, I mean, I think that, that you have to have something that, that is equally potent to the profit motive. I mean, I, I've always contended, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that no drug company would uh, uh, license a drug that they thought would result in suits that would result in their uh, the complete downfall of the company. So they all think that they're going to make money in one way or the other, and mostly they bury these the, the adverse effects when they're already committed to this drug, and they you know, or if they think that they can get away with it and pay for the for the lawsuits and still make money. I mean, I think that that's the bottom line is the bottom line. Yes. I also work in drug companies, uh -huh. and I can tell you how they handle the whistleblower. They fire them. Yeah. Well, so I mean, if you have them, but they don't last long. <laughs> yeah, um, so I actually worked at the FDA last year, so I can uh, speak to some of the things. Well, one, uh, I know it looks like we're doing a horrible job, but I can promise you that um, we do try to prevent the most egregious mistakes. and. Um, a, a lot of the people there are very committed to the public health and are trying to do their job. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.